Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On January 3rd, 1977, co-founders Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs officially incorporated a tiny little company called Apple Computer Company. They would find themselves in a whirlwind towards being arguably the best company in the world over the next four decades. In this same year, this week's guest started his journey with a small little entity that would grow into what I believe is the greatest sports museum in the world, and it all revolved around the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is June 1st, 1977 in Canton, Ohio. We're here, and it's the morning because we're sitting there eating our breakfast and we're watching a young man walk up to the Professional Football Hall of Fame. He is starting his career, his first day on the job at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which over 40 years later, he would end up becoming what they call throughout Mr. Pro Football Hall of Fame. Maybe he didn't know it at that time, but over the years, he would wear many, many hats for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he would help become one of the architects of the greatest sports museum in the world. He was heavily involved in many of your favorite moments during Entrainment Weekend, one of which might have been the election process, and then making it, making that call. Also, how about putting the whole thing on? But let's sit back. Let's get more into this and so much more during the episode. That guest, well, oh yeah, we got to get to him. Mr. Pro Football Hall of Fame is Joe Horrigan, and we're going to dive into some very cool topics that you're not going to get anywhere else other than direct from Mr. Joe Horrigan. I mean, it's a bummer because last weekend, this past weekend that is, it was supposed to be enshrinement weekend for the 2020 class. Birthday of the NFL is supposed to be in almost a month and they're going to have another, the centennial class celebration. So again, it's a bummer that we have to deal with this, but I'm hoping that maybe this episode and some of the other episodes we had revolving around the Hall of Fame can at least alleviate or give you some more information about the history of what, again, I believe is the greatest sports museum in the world. And if you stick around to the end of the episode, I'm going to share with you the past couple of years, some of the experiences I had as, uh, I guess you could technically say a press pass holder, or media, that kind of thing, as far as the Pro Football Hall of Fame and Tramont Weekend goes. But again, you're going to have to stay until the end of the episode for that one. But before we get into the interview, we got another giveaway for you. Joe has a book covering the 100 years of the league, and he's offered to autograph that baby, send it over to one lucky winner. The best way to get your chance to win this book is to check out the link in your podcast player, or you can just head over straight to thefootballhistorydude.com, which of course takes you over to my page on the Sports History Network, where you can find some other great football history shows, or even we're starting to get some other sports in there as well. So go ahead, take a look at that over at sportshistorynetwork.com. But for now, let's get right into the interview with Mr. Pro Football Hall of Fame, Joe Horrigan. Obviously, you spent a long time with the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, I saw an interview, maybe it wasn't an interview, maybe it was Rich Eisen right after you had 
retired. There was on his Rich Eisen podcast. And he talked about, he made a joke. Well, is the Hall of Fame still standing? Because I believe that Joe Horgan was the only reason why it was standing or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's just go back to the beginning. I mean, sure. let's, what was it? June 1st, 1977 or something like that, that you started there? Yeah, June 1st, 1977 is when I was officially hired. Uh, I had come down earlier, obviously, for some interviews and went through the whole interview process. And I always tell the story because, you know, while football history was always in my blood and it was something I always found, uh, you know, intriguing and interesting and not well preserved. And frankly, it was not easy finding good sources. In any case, in the context of uh, my interview, the uh, chairman of the board for the Hall of Fame asked, you know, hey, Joe, if you could meet one Hall of Famer, who would it be? And I thought for a second, obviously, I'm looking, I'm being interviewed for a job. I'm trying to think, you know, there's got to be a right answer here. And I said, well, you know, the truth is, I said, if if I did want to, I had the opportunity to meet one Hall of Famer, I think it would be Marion Motley. And my reason was that my father had covered the old All-American football conferences as a sports writer. And if there were two players that he thought you know, walked on water, it was Otto Graham and Marion Motley. And I'd always heard the stories about Mary Motley. And I'd read a book by Myron Cope, in which he uh, actually interviewed Marion. In any case, uh, that was my choice. And all of a sudden, the chairman looks at me and he kind of got this odd look on his face. And he says, well, I think I can arrange that one. I didn't know. But at the time, Mary Motley lived in Canton. <laughs> he was born and raised in Canton, had been living in Cleveland, would go back and forth between Canton and Cleveland. So we actually went to uh, lunch that day. So that oh, was kind wow. of, you know. Be careful what you wish for, I guess. <laughs> it was really pretty. Really, I'm sure he thought it was that someone tipped me off, you know. And I said, "Geez, I, I had no idea he lived here." So that was kind of the, the beginning of the, you know my introduction to the Hall of Fame and uh, literally at my job interview. So it only made me want the job more. Uh, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I had never really thought I was going to get in the business. That wasn't my aspiration. My father had been in pro sports. All his life, uh, first as a uh, writer with the uh, United Press, he did news and sports, starting way back in 1949. But I'm sorry, in 46. But he also, um, uh, as I mentioned, covered uh, uh, the All America Football Conference, which you know I heard about. You know, obviously I was born in 51, so the league was already defunct by the time I was born. But it was it was um, something I'd heard a lot about, and I grew up. I, I always joked that I had, you know boxing shorts before I had a bicycle because of the sports that my father would cover. I always hung out with, you know, with only drag my brother and I along. We'd go to, you know, gyms. Uh, we'd, uh, you know, go to you know, sporting events. Sometimes we didn't even know what sport it was. Uh, so I sat through a lot of minor league baseball games, minor league hockey games. And in 1960, the Buffalo Bills started. And he was assigned now working with the Buffalo Evening News. Uh, he was signed to be the beat reporter. And that's where the relationship with the uh, American Football League began with him. He quickly thereafter in 1963 was named the league uh, 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 public relations director. I had to think what his title was, public relations director. Uh, and he, he held on to that position until the merger, at which time uh, Ralph Wilson invited him to uh, you know, rejoin uh, the Buffalo Bills, or I should say rejoin, joined the Buffalo Bills as their vice president and public relations director. And it was an opportunity to go back home, so to speak, too. So he did that. And uh, at the same time, this is just kind of a personal note, but he had been diagnosed with cancer back in 1964. So things were not looking great for him. And Ralph was fully aware of that. But uh, Ralph, being the man he was, said, I don't care. He says, you know, you know, I want you to come back home. I want you to work here with me. And uh, it was very, very good to my father. So in any case, my father held that position until 1973 when he passed away. So at that point, you know, I'm in the military at that time, actually. I'd gone to Canisius College for a year, dropped out, went into the military for four years, and then returned to Canisius to finish my uh, degree, which I actually finished at the University of Akron. But long story. But in any case, uh, during that time, I was thinking, you know, I never thought about being in the sports business. I always had you know, nepotism uh, had been uh, a big part of my life. I was a ball boy with the Buffalo Bills in 68 and 69. I was the runner in the American Football League draft in 64 and 65. Uh, I'd always worked home games starting in Buffalo, every home game you know, from 1966 until I went in the service and I returned to that. Uh, you know, I came here to the hall. I still went home on weekends to work Hall of Fame games. So I was always involved, but I never really thought it was going to be my life. And, uh, 
when the job came at the opportunity at the Hall of Fame, somebody had recommended me. I didn't know about it. Uh, and I thought, you know, maybe let's take a look at this. So long story short, I was the fortunate one that they hired. And 42, year, 42 years later, I retired from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, that's a definitely a unique story that I didn't even realize that you had your grassroots were in sports well before even the Hall of Fame came into existence. Well, I, I joke and I say, you know, I worked at the Hall for 42 years, but uh, from 1963 until um, I went to uh, the Hall of Fame, minus the four years I was in the military. So from 1963 to 1977, I had you know, part-time jobs in professional football since I was 13. Man, so, talk about someone like me. That would have been, I, I don't know, I don't want to use the word dream job, but that would have been a dream job. You know, and, and I, I tell people this all the time. The, they were, I guess, you know, in hindsight, they were dream jobs. What kid wouldn't want them? Uh, but particularly in the training camp, I mean, we worked you know, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. morning till seven at night. We got paid 50 bucks. I mean, it wasn't a heck of a, you know, you weren't going to make a lot of money doing it. And at the time, you know, I, I've been raised around athletes. It wasn't that I was, you know, this kid, in, you know, with big eyes and all of everything, but, you know, I, I, you know, I'm still friends with a lot of the guys that I worked with. James Harris was a quarterback in 69 for Buffalo. He and I are very good friends. Eddie Rakowski, Jack Kemp, Billy Shaw, you know, they were all, I've stayed in touch with them all these years and they remain friends for life. So I look at it more as kind of a part of my life as a part of my sports life. How much do you think that played a factor when you grew up into why you stayed for so long at the Hall of Fame? Well, you know, it's, it was one of those things where, you know, I, I often say this, you know, how many people get to get up in the morning, go to a job that they really want to do and, you know, they enjoy it. There's not very much that, uh, you know, obviously every job has its drawbacks at times, uh, you know, challenges, but, you know, it was something I truly enjoyed doing, and I was given pretty much free reign. Uh, when I started at the Hall of Fame, there were only nine, counting me, nine full-time employees. Uh, there's probably 60-some now and 250 part-time. I don't know. We didn't have any part-time. So it was really a, kind of a, a grassroots beginning. So we were able to start and really take it any direction we, you know, thought was right. And we, you know, we took some gambles, we took some risks, uh, and eventually built it into what I consider the number one sports hall of fame in the world. Uh, it's certainly much, much larger than it was when I you know, started there. We built what is now the Ralph Wilson Research and Preservation Center, the archives. You know, we've added educational programs, you know, we've quadrupled the size of the facility. The enshrinement ceremony went from a, a quaint little gathering on the front steps of the Hall of Fame that wasn't even televised. There was very little media attention to it. To now it's uh, three national networks nationally televised to sell out crowds in a stadium. So it grew, you know, over that 40 plus years. And I'm not saying that's certainly all on me. It isn't all on me. All the people that worked with us you know, through those years, some very long times, others for brief times. But we worked together doing what we really loved doing and had a very, very supportive board of trustees all through those years. And it changed like everything else. Uh, but they were always willing to, you know, believe in us, let us go our own way and, and create what we thought was best for the sport. I hope that what you were able to experience is similar to what I'm trying to build here with. Um, so this is the Football History Dude podcast, but that was just born out of my passion for history mashed with sports together, mostly football and the NFL. But recently I've started something called the Sports History Network, which is a... Uh, I've seen that. Uh, aggregation i guess you could say of a bunch of um the goal is to i, I here's my tagline i'm creating the home field advantage for people <laughs> that maybe have a technology gap or they just don't know how to get into podcasting or other things like that you know football historians baseball historians things like that and the goal is to help them grow and reach an audience and then just help them with the technology and maybe sure. as we grow it'll be somewhat similar to that down the road and well you know it's it's that kind of thing and i would give you you i know you're very familiar with the pro football researchers association and and that began in my office with bob carroll who was its first executive director really its founder you know, bob kind of brought this idea to me we were you know i had met bob he had been working with my predecessor at the hall of fame you know doing some research and I say research, we really didn't have a research facility and technology didn't exist that you could you know, go online and get newspaper clips and so on. We had to you know, travel to historical societies and hope they had microfilm. We were really lucky they had us look at the real paper. You know, so it was this passion that Bob had that he brought to the Hall of Fame, knew that I was doing it for a living, you know, and the, and the passion you know, existed therein. 
But what we had were there was a couple of people that Bob had been working with, and then I had a whole list of people who had been writing to the Hall of Fame for you know interest in you know wanting information. I said, just like you're saying, why don't we take these names and, and bring them together and see if they'd be interested in being a part of this PFRA Pro Football Researchers Association? And we had uh, a meeting in Canton. Uh, I can't even tell you what year it was. I think it was 1981, I think. And and there was um, I think eight of us. And they ranged from, uh, you know, a, a PhD to a mailman. I mean, it was, a, you know, we were just guys, amateur historians, because there really wasn't pro football historians out there that took it as a serious endeavor. You know, there were hobbyists. And we wanted to transform that into some serious research. And, and to, do, to give due credit, you know, Bob had been a member of SABRE, the Society of American Baseball Researchers. And he felt that, that was kind of what he was going to model it after. And then we wanted to elevate it just one step more to be a publishing uh, opportunity for you know people like Bob, who was a, a school teacher uh, who had never really written anything for publication by the time he passed away a few years back, several years back now. But uh, at the time of his death, he was author of multiple books and articles. So it, it, it opened that door for him and others, not just Bob, uh, names that people in the, in the PFRA would certainly recognize that got opportunities to publish and not just self-publish, but publish through you know, a major publisher. Yeah, the PFRA, we talked about a little bit, uh, I think two, three episodes ago with Ken Crippen. And I mentioned this in our pre-interview that he, he mentioned your name and that came up. He said, without Joe, it might have been more challenging. And the, take me back to that room. You said maybe your office or whatever. Like, what was what was that genesis? How did it go? Well, you know, and the genesis really was Bob saying, you know, he told me about Sabre. I was unfamiliar with Sabre. And he was saying, you know, that there's, I think we could do something like that for football. And something like that meant, all right, Joe, you know, how do we get this started? You know, Bob was, like I say, a school teacher and he, he really had no connections to the pro football world. So what we really did is we took um, the Hall of Fame's uh, media mailing list. And we sent a letter out saying, hey, we're going to try this. We're going to start this. We're going to have this uh, membership. If you want to join, I think I think our original membership was $15. That may be high, actually. I'm not even sure. But we had people respond, you know, if you that became members, not contributing members. One of the first respondents was Wellington Mara. You know, he thought it was a great idea. You know, but it, and that was very flattering to us. We really had only done a couple of prototypes of uh, newsletters that we sent out to some friends with a staple in the six or eight pages we you know, typed in the mimeographed. Uh, so it wasn't wasn't that we had a lot to show for ourselves, but it, it grew slowly. And uh, Bob was you know editor from day one because he was willing to do it, first of all. But a lot of it was work we'd already done, just kind of repurposed it more for, for popular consumption. Uh, and then we started doing things like, you know, Hey, are, is there anybody out there that's interested in this? Or what are your interests? Let us know. And it, and it, it just kind of grew like that. And every time I would get an inquiry at the Hall of Fame, which is often, you know, something that I would sense, all right, this guy's interested in football history. I would send back to him an opportunity to join PFRA. And, you know, we went from eight to 200 and some pretty quickly. And then it kind of it kind of plateaued. You know, we, we didn't have campaign drives for membership. But we were getting a lot of submissions from some very serious, uh, mostly hobbyists, but some some academians that that you know really took it seriously. And we uh, had an opportunity to do a call for papers uh, in conjunction with Kent State Stark, which is Stark coming here in Ohio uh, for some academic uh, papers and things like that. We started to take a serious bent to it, uh, and then there were great there were great members early on members like. David Neft, who is very well known in base, baseball and football, uh, John Hagrobian, John Thorne, uh, Jim Campbell, many others that, you know, were very serious writers and researchers that you know uh, add credential to our organization. So we tried to keep them in officer positions as much as best as we could always. Uh, but it, it was a slow go. Uh, but I, I still go back and look at what we wrote. And a lot of things we you know, wrote under pseudonyms sometimes because I had to be careful not to be spending too much time. Uh, because I was doing this for a living also. So <clears throat> Bob and I would come off of things just called PFRA, you know, we would put our names on it. And we had to be careful also because we were finding things that literally we um, alerted the NFL to teams they didn't even know they had in the league. I mean, it was um, it was it was very virgin territory. Pro football history was not well documented at all. Uh, I had the great, um, I guess, advantage that uh, I was given access to 
all of the league meeting minutes going all the way back to 1920. Uh, they're abbreviated meeting minutes, like usually meeting minutes are. And sometimes you, you have to try to figure out, follow who the, who the people are, where they came from. It's not very clear. So you become a bit of a sleuth. And then you get, kind of balance that against, you know, again, going to this historical soci- societies and getting news clips and uh, any kind of biographical information you can find on the uh, founders of the league, the people involved, who they were, what they did. None of them did it for, you know, as their sole source of income. They all had the jobs. Yeah, well, when uh, when Bob and I were, were working, you know, we were always working together. And, uh, um, you know, we had pretty much uh, concentrated on that 1892 to 1933 when the league became two division, uh, two divisions opposed to one. So I, I think in a, in a decade of, of a period, we probably really put together the uh, a much better accounting of pro football history than certainly than the NFL had. Theirs was full of errors. We uh, we did have a meeting and uh, did get the uh, league to change a lot of uh, mistakes in their record of back book. It wasn't so much individual records. It was more about the history and chronology of the league, uh, milestone events, and so on. And the fact that there were franchises that, that were literally granted to the National Football League that were not listed in their record and fact book. And it was largely because they – they went away uh, by the time they had built the record, started the record. In fact, both those teams didn't exist. And there was a requirement that they play a certain number of games to be in the championship running. But that didn't mean they weren't franchises in the National Football League if they didn't play those many, that many games. So we convinced them of that, and they got finally their recognition they deserve. So we felt very good about getting off uh, on, on that you know, beginning, although it was a long time coming. But we also, you know, we, we enlisted the help of so many others that, you know, were professionals and, and highly skilled amateurs to uh, get involved in all facets and avenues of pro football history. But we got a, a good nucleus started and we plateaued at about 250 members, which we were very happy with. You know, we didn't have any kind of staff or anything to run this. Poor Bob did all of our mailings. And, and then we eventually hired a part time uh, person to do that. Uh, but he was the editor in chief, and he was really the glue throughout its history. It's um, you know, not only its glue, but its backbone. Uh, I became its recruiter because everybody that wrote to the Hall of Fame, searching for information or indicated an interest in history, that's where I would plug them into PFRA and connect them with people with similar interests. So Bob Carroll is a name that needs to probably be more mentioned or known or things like that when we're talking about pro football history. Yeah, Bob was a bit of an introvert. Uh, Bob was very, very private, um, never looked for any attention. He just loved uh, doing what he did. And the irony of it is, as quiet a man as he was, uh, one of his other part-time uh, jobs, he's, he did TV commercials. <laughs> <laughs> he liked little theater. He did little theater. He became a different person. He, you know, he became an actor. Right, but right. In his everyday life, you know, it was hard to get him to you know, converse. Great sense of humor, very sarcastic, but you had to know Bob to get it out of him. Uh, had great moments. Bob used to come and sleep at my house, and we'd go down to the Ohio Historical Society for a weekend just to go through microfilm until our eyes bled. Uh, so, you know, we, we were very fast and furious friends for many years. Yeah, I could just imagine that. I mean, it's not the exact same thing, but like you said, the pro football, a lot of things were uncovered by you and Bob and the other members, almost like. Well, the, the earth has to be flat, right? And then until they found out it wasn't. <laughs> well, you know, and, and I, I, I say, you know, I, I, and I hope I'm not repeating myself because we did lose connection there for a minute. But uh, you know, I, I spoke with Ken Crippen once about, you know, PFRA members now, uh, rather than trying to look for that new avenue of something that hasn't been researched, you should go back and look at the stuff that you know, people like Bob and myself, you know, did in those early years. And see if it's still relevant. See if it still holds. You know, with its with its facts. You know, fact check a lot better than we could when we wrote things. Uh, and then see what the relevance and the significance of those things are today. You know how they impacted football of today uh, through what we you know, kind of talked about back then. I, you know, there's more. There's more of looking at football history and not just you know regurgitating it, but challenge it a little bit. Make sure we were right and. Maybe uh, start adding some of the social implications, which we may not have used because we were focused solely on pro football at the time. We weren't thinking, you know, about what it might have meant in Americana. So there's all sorts of ways of, you know, taking what was done once, looking at it again from a totally different perspective and, and coming up with something altogether new. 
Yeah, I mean, even when I started my podcast, I did solo episodes pretty much primarily. And I utilize the PFRA extensively, the the different articles and things. And I just, I don't know why, but I just like the writing style of like the really old, the older articles. They just seem like there was character involved in there. I don't know. I I, I will give you that. That's Bob. Bob had a very, uh, very different kind of writing style. He didn't write as an academician. He, you know, he didn't write as a, I'm a know-it-all. He he used tongue in cheek a lot. I mean, he, he liked being, he liked injecting subtlety. Uh, Bob was pretty clever that way. So I, I always enjoyed reading Bob's stuff too. He, you know, he made sometimes, um, I don't want to call it analytical, but but um, fairly mundane information interesting. And that's, a, that's a, a skill. Yeah. I mean, just reading through his stuff and I'm sure he wasn't the only one, but that name did, that name popped out in my mind reading through articles even before I realized he was there at the beginning of it all, just because I didn't know much about the history of the PFRA at the time. No, oh, yeah, there was um, there were in the, in the initial core group. You know, there were only two or three of us that really did writing. Others had you know interest and would support with information. Uh, you know, I, I can remember one one early member named Jim Stewart, uh, and Jim was a uh, a guy that just loved football, and he could remember everything. He went to every Philadelphia Eagles game since 1933. You know, so, I mean, and he, he knew everything, remembered everything, and it was just great listening to him because obviously it helps to have a fan's perspective on what the game meant. And then you you, know, you start, you know, introducing, you know, some of our PFRA members to, to the actual participants in the game, you know, for interviews and that sort of thing. We would have uh, an annual meeting and we'd invite in sometimes Hall of Famers. Marion Motley was one. We had Lynn Houston. I can remember Joe Tarashinsky from the Redskins. Uh, you know, he was a great guy. I know him before he invited him to do this, but they would just reminisce with these guys. Sit down in a room with twenty guys and just talk. And it was it was great stuff. It was uh, it was a way to tie the fan and you know watch them, you know, twenty and thirty and forty years ago uh, to finally meet them. You know, there was our boy here, boyhood heroes who they're meeting when they're seventy years old. It was kind of fun. Yeah, it's just something that. So two years ago. I got my press passes to the Hall of Fame induction when Ray Lewis, that class, and he was my favorite non-Detroit Lions player of all time. And I, I've only been to the Hall of Fame once prior to that, and it was with my father. It was when Barry Sanders was still, I want to say he was still running, but they had a, it, it was like the AstroTurf of the, the Lions, you know, that kind of thing. So I never went after that. And when I was growing up, I always thought, how cool would it be? to go to the induction ceremony. And then here I am with the press passes doing this thing. It's just it, like to bring back that thing that you said, this boyhood, you're seeing your heroes. And it's like, it was surreal to be able to experience that. And they're getting inducted to the hall of fame. You know, I'll tell you two quick stories. One was at the uh, groundbreaking ceremony for the hall of fame in 1963. There was this kid from Stowe, Ohio, who kind of skipped out of school to come down to see it with his dad. And then there was, his name was Larry Zonka. And then there was another kid who lived right in the neighborhood who came over on his bike named Dan Deerdorf. And then Marion Motley was participating as a re- recently retired local guy. Uh, so they invited him to be a part of the, putting the uh, shovel into the ground. And then uh, um, there was another Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer, who actually worked on the construction crew as a sweeper while he was going to high school. That was Alan Page, who lived in Canton, had a job with the construction crew building the Hall of Fame. So at that very first ceremony, there's four kids who had ne- no idea, three or four, Marion had already finished his career, but three others who had probably no uh, inclination that they would ever be in the Hall of Fame, nor would they ever play in the NFL or maybe even college football that actually did. So that's kind of the things where you know dreams do come true even when they're not a dream sometimes. <laughs> but another one, when I, I retired, my board of selectors, the, the members of the media that actually elect the Hall of Famers, you know, that I've been administering that process for decades. And that's really a, a big part of my job. was a big part of my job and one that I really enjoyed doing. Well, at my last meeting, I waited. Uh, that's where I wanted to announce that I was retiring. So I did that at the Super Bowl that were when we met for the selection meeting. And they were prepared for it. And one of my selectors had uh, uh, asked all of the other selectors to email. A, a note, a letter to me that he then put in a binder, uh, you know, kind of 
a really nice salute to me. And I, and, and I accepted it that day. And, you know, I was very emotional and I didn't want to read it then because I didn't want to cry in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I went until I got home and one of the selectors uh, uh, wrote a, a, a nice letter about how when he was in high school, he called the Hall of Fame to work on working on a research project and got a hold of me. And he said, I, I treated him like he worked for the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or the New York Times, this kid from you know, Cincinnati. And I had no idea I had ever done that. You know, D. Orlando Ledbetter from the Atlanta uh, Journal Constitution. And he was just saying how that meant so much to him at the time. I think, you know, you do things like that every day of your life, you know, and you don't know that it's doing anything for anybody else. So that was really a really important moment for me to know that here's a guy that he had never told me about this. And I've been working <laughs> with him for years. And he waited until that moment to tell me that story, which was really pretty neat. Yeah, it just goes a testament to after I've done some of the research for the interview, that's all I heard was he's such a good guy. You're such, you know, you're there to help everybody else. And again, going back to 42 years, we talked about when you first came into the Hall of Fame, what transition like how did your career track go and what were you responsible for throughout yeah okay well when i got there i was hired uh, as curator and researcher and i was curator i'm not sure what they had in mind but uh, no museum training uh, but the, the hall of fame was a pretty modest place at the time and the collection was very small it was not well maintained uh, and that was very obvious to me uh, and I kind of took that part as a, as a serious challenge that, uh, you know, what do we need to do to make this a legitimate museum? And um, I quickly became involved. Like there was the PFRA, well, there was a new organization for museums in the state of Ohio called the Ohio Museums Association. I became intimately involved in them and eventually became an officer in the group. And I took it very seriously. I attended every kind of seminar or anything I could do for professional training. And I recruited and, and just like we did with PFRA, you know, created a network of the exchange of ideas. How do we do this? How do we take collections, make them uh, better maintained, better cataloged, and so on? I was in the when I, was, I spent four years in the military, and I did do that in this in the service. I was in charge of uh, warehousing and, and maintaining records and so on. So I knew the logistical challenges that exist, and I, I had a I used the military system for identification. So it, it started that way. And that, I took the role of curator and really made it into a professional museum position over the 19 years that I was curator. Uh, at the same time, that other half evolved from researcher to director of research information. And then eventually, after 19 years, I was made a vice president, a vice president of exhibits and communication. So I was, they didn't want to separate me. That they, back when I was promoted, the board chairman said, look, you know, we don't want to just move you over here. We want you to continue doing what you're doing, but we want to make you do this now, too. So you're getting two positions. Congratulations. <laughs> so I became literally the, the communications director, vice president of communications and exhibits, and I, I, I ran the museum. Um, that eventually became uh, executive vice president of the Hall of Fame and then executive director. So I've done everything. I've run the uh, uh, selection process probably for 30, 35 years, I suppose. Um, and that, like I said before, was a, a very big part of it. I was the executive producer for the enshrinement ceremony, which we uh, took from that you know, quaint little occurrence on the front steps every year over to a stadium and uh, got television involved. Finally got ESPN started with them. And then Chris Berman became a very good friend and I convinced him to become our MC. And then this new fledgling network came along called NFL Network uh, with Rich Eisen. We came fast and furious friends and uh, we convinced that network to uh, and this this was challenging because you know they were looking for content, uh, they were looking for opportunities. But ESPN had been our partner, and uh, you know you don't you don't hurt your partner to help a new new partner. So you know, we um, sat down, had a conversation where they would um, uh, co-broadcast uh, both networks, and not only that, but they would share in the um, technical pr uh, production which again was unheard of. You know, we would have like, for instance, a what we call a rain plan. In case it rained, we would try to move the enshrinement to an indoor facility, which would only hold about 4,000. We were not quite sure how we thought we'd get 20,000 into that 4,000 facility, but we would set it up and we would have cameras already preset. We would have everything, we'd set up a whole broadcast. ESPN, the larger of the two networks at the time, 
would set it up and they would allow NFL Network to hook to it in, in the case. And then for the same sake of, of uh, a quality performance or, or uh, I guess, a presentation, we wanted to have a cent center camera or straight onto the uh, stage for the enshrinement ceremony plus all the ancillary cameras. Uh, but to being having two networks duplicating everything didn't make sense. So they decided they would shareware. The central camera was shared by the two networks. The ENGs that would go on the network or on the stage would do the same thing. So it was. I thought uh, that was really an accomplishment to get those two networks. And they continue to this day, you know, working together. And of course, we had uh, ABC, now NBC, doing the game. So we went from nothing to three major networks televising the Hall of Fame. We went from no television coverage to 11 nationally televised broadcasts every year. Yeah, no, no museum, no Hall of Fame in, in the world has eleven nationally broadcast events. So that that was a you know big accomplishment. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing, I kind of be, finished my career where I began in the sense of my focus on the museum becoming legitimate and, and well run. We're the only major sports Hall of Fame right now. This we just happened about four years ago, I guess. Now uh, we were we're uh, now uh, the only major sports hall of fame nationally accredited by the Alliance of, uh, American Alliance of Museums. And only 3% of the museums in this country, there's over 30,000 museums, and only 3% of them are nationally accredited. And we're one of them. So I consider that a major accomplishment as well. Yeah, I would. And what's even the process to go about becoming nationally accredited? Well, it, it's, uh, it's a long process. And, and, you know, people say, well, how many years, you know, how long did it take? And, and the physical actual application to, to approval was about three, three and a half years. But I say that really took 42 years because from day one, we were working towards that goal, changing everything. I mean, you know, we had to make place, it was built to commercial standards. It wasn't built to museums, it was a physical place. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't proper HVAC for museums, all the environmental control systems, all the cataloging of collections, the proper care and treatment of collections, all the, all the, uh, museum standards that you you know uh, strive to achieve, that took forty years to really do. We you know we started our staff um, you know and many of them <laughs> didn't finish with us, but you know over the years that was always our our intent was to be as professional as our budget would allow, which was always challenging, and our abilities would allow. But eventually we got to the point where we said, you know let's attack this thing dead on, and we spent about three and a half years going through the process peer review, preparation, all sorts of uh, requirements that you have to fulfill. And then uh, be, uh, uh, you literally have to be reviewed by uh, a panel uh, of museum professionals. And very few, um, like I say, 3% of 33,000 uh, is not a lot. No, that's not a lot at all. And it just made me think of how many museums I've been to throughout my days. And I mean, <laughs> that, that definitely... Just three percent of thirty-three thousand. I, I just can't imagine that going from nineteen sixty-three, what I saw some of those photos, to what we are now. You know, when you go to twenty twenty, it's it's amazing how it's grown, and you've been able to be there throughout. Have you ever felt like uh, I don't know Indiana Jones going through finding <laughs> artifacts or something? I, I sometimes I felt like I was I was creating something for the next Indiana Jones. Not come find it. You know. <laughs> there you um, go. Uh, one of my board members once said, you know, when they opened the Hall of Fame, it was the first museum to ever open without a collection. <laughs> he said, we went on the world's largest uh, uh, scavenger hunt looking for something to put in it. And that's kind of how it was run for the first decade or so. Was, you know, let's keep finding things. They were, you know, there was really not a, a, a master plan as to what they were trying to eventually end up with, you know, specifically pro football. But yes, but, you know, what? You know, artifacts are you know three three dimensional storytellers. But there's also near and dear to my heart the research center, which is the, if you will, it's the uh, ephemera, the paper collection of the history of the game, the records and the record keeping. That's maybe more important than the physical artifacts of achievement. Uh, they both make museums, but I, I think if you don't have that historical record, you know, then it's going to be that much more difficult for somebody to get the proper understanding and perspective of what the sport means has accomplished and, and continues to mean. Yeah, that kind of leads me into, I have a listener question. Uh, Christopher Lawton from 99yards.com. One of his questions was, what artifacts in the hall fascinate you the most? Or what would be like, if you could only take one and you're running out of the building, which one would it be? <laughs> oh no. 
will there be some incriminating evidence on this episode that we have next week? I don't know. But either way, you're going to have to find out. You're going to have to tune in next week to find out which artifact Joe would grab if he was running out of the burning building. Speaking of that, well, what artifact would you grab if you were at the Hall of Fame and they said, you just won the golden ticket. You can take any artifact out of this Hall of Fame. Which one would it be? Which one do you think is the most important? Obviously, we're not going to put monetary values because that's impossible for most of the artifacts in the Hall of Fame. Which one would you grab? Well, if you are interested, record that, send it in to the website, and we'll go ahead and play it on the show. Best way you can do that is by going to thefootballhistorydude.com, which takes you over to my page on the Sports History Network, which is your headquarters for the favorite sports yesteryear. While you're at it, don't forget, again, there's a free giveaway. Joe's going to give us a copy of his book. He's going to autograph it. He's going to send it out to one lucky winner. <laughs> Will it be you? But I don't know. Going to have to tune in next week to find out. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, I wanted to share with you a little bit of my experiences as a Hall of Fame the past couple years during the entrainment weekend. I mean, I was thankfully fortunate enough to get press passes for 2018 and 2019. 2018 was the year where you had Brian Dawkins, Brian Urlacher, Randy Moss. I mean, we had Ray Lewis, for me, my favorite non-Detroit Lions player of all time that I was able to watch. I mean, I didn't get to actually ask him questions specifically in the press pass room, but I was able to, during the press conference, talk to Brian Urlacher. I asked him a question about what he thought about the George Hallis family and what that meant to the Bears. He gave a really cool story. Brian Dawkins asked him a couple questions. I asked him to Robert Brazil. I really got to talk to him probably four or five different questions. That was pretty cool. It was just neat. It was something that I was super nervous because I'm sitting here holding a microphone talking to these Pro Football Hall of Famers and I'm like just some dude starting my show. That was only four months after I had had my podcast and I'm like, man, this is just, this is wild out. It's far out. It's kind of cool. So then the next year I go and I am a little bit more comfortable, had started doing interviews from there. I mean, I had some great questions with Gil Brandt. I had, I don't know, three or four straight questions in a row. And I, as I'm talking about this and I sent out an email earlier, I realized I don't think I've ever even played any of this stuff on the podcast before. Maybe I had that, uh, you know, was it good enough kind of thing. So maybe you'll hear that coming out. And hopefully next time when they have the Hall of Fame, maybe I can go again and we can share some of that stuff with you. But the best part, this is why I, this is the part, the reason why I wanted to bring down the show again and Longtime listeners of the show have heard these before, these whole my favorite football moments. And the cool thing about the Hall of Fame Entrainment Weekend is, well, <laughs> you got a whole bunch of football geeks all over the place, right? So we did it on the street interviews and we would hand them the mic or I'd give them the mic, hold it in their face, you know, the whole interview style reporters on the street. And I'd say, hey, what is your favorite football moment of all time? Most of them are going to revolve around teams that or at least the players that were in being inducted to the Hall of Fame that year. So whether it was the year Randy Moss went in, so you have all different types of teams and players, and the year that we had Champ Bailey, so it was a lot of Denver Bronco fans, and you had, oh, geez, I don't know, 30 John Elway stories. There's a whole bunch of them. But at any rate, the one that stuck out in my mind the most from last year, really, best way to put it, you're gonna, I'm going to put it on here, you can listen to it, and you can see why this one stuck out to me big time. This is from Howie Asa. My name is Howie Asa. I'm from Haskell, New Jersey. Oh, my favorite football moment of all times. <laughs> These are all my buddies. They've heard this story a hundred times. Is when I met Joe Namath back in 1968. Uh, it was my first football game. And... I went there with a photographer named Henry Wendell. He worked for the Amsterdam News, and I knew absolutely nothing about football. I went to the game with him, and when I say I knew nothing, I knew nothing. When the team was coming out, he said, that's our quarterback. And I said, with the fur coat? And he says, that's our quarterback. And he called Joe over, introduced me to him, and he had the biggest hands I could ever imagine. I had 
Joe started talking to me. And that day, I became a Jet fan. Back in 1968, <sighs> I've been a Jet fan ever since. It's my son. I made him a Jet fan from the day he was born. Joe taught me the game of football that day. His first series, he got out on the field, and he got on the center, and the little tough guy that I thought I was, I turned around and I said to Henry, I said, look, he's got his hands up, that other guy's behind. And he said, no, he's on the center. I said, what's that? Joe came back and he explained it to me. Three quarters through the game, he said to me, after he explained the game to me, which I learned very well that day, he says, I'm going to throw a touchdown for you. He then threw a touchdown for me, signed the ball, gave it to me. I kept that ball till my house burned down. <laughs> It was fantastic. <laughs> that was the greatest football time of my life. Good story, man. I love the Jets so much. My son has two daughters. And my granddaughters came home in Jets onesies. I will be a Jets fan forever. That's my story. You see why I told you if that one <laughs> sticks out for you? I mean, if that one didn't make you tear up, then uh, you might want to go check your pulse. Head right to a hospital right now because you might be a robot. And danger, Will Robinson, and all those kinds of things. But... That wasn't where the story ended. The coolest part, and I don't know if I've even shared this on the show before, but maybe a couple months after that, three months, whatever it was, somehow it popped up in my mind. This is a cool story. We got to send this out. I sent it out to the Jets organization, the, the clip and everything, explaining, man, this guy lost his football. We got to do something to help this guy out. And I was thinking maybe they could just, I don't know, send him a, hey, sorry about your luck. That, <laughs> Thanks for being a Jets fan. But no, they did something really cool. The Jets organization, they took that information, they took his little uh, clip and such, and they took, they gave him, <laughs> they shipped him an autographed Broadway Joe football. I mean, they didn't, they didn't have to do that, but they took it. I'm sure they had a whole bunch of them in their warehouse and they sent him an autographed football. So talk about the emotions and how cool that is that your team was able to do something like that for you. Now, if he wasn't a fan for life, that really hooked him. But you heard in the episode, he is a Jets fan for life. So I just wanted to share that with you and how cool it is. Football is family. That's one of the mottos. And just, if you have your own favorite football moment, send it on in. I, I love hearing those. That's the best part about the show is to get to hear how other people were introduced to football, how they were able to experience it as a, as a family and all those kinds of things. And oh yeah, that's right. There's there's also, if you want to hear more about or learn more about this story and some of the stuff that I do as far as the press conferences go with the Hall of Fame, go to the site, this page, this website, or this week. We got more stories up there for you. And don't forget, when you're over there, you got to sign up for the free book from author Joel Horrigan covering the 100 years of the league. I mean, he's going to autograph that thing for you. He's going to send it over to one lucky winner. And then listen to next week's episode and you'll find out who won the book as well as <laughs> the second part of the interview. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. 
We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.